During the Cold War, in the jungles of Southeast Asia, British forces fought communist guerrillas who had proclaimed a war of national liberation in Malaya. Sounds a bit like Vietnam? Well, maybe, except for one big difference. In Malaya, the communists were defeated. The Malayan emergency was one of the few successful counterinsurgency operations undertaken by Western powers during the Cold War. 1,500 British and Commonwealth troops lost their lives, including men from Australia, New Zealand, Fiji and Rhodesia, along with 1,300 local troops and police. 6,000 communist fighters and somewhere around 7,000 civilians were also killed. It was a conflict that was never referred to as a war. To avoid insurance companies refusing to pay up on damaged rubber plantations and tin mines, it was always officially an emergency. So this is the story of the Malayan emergency of 1948 to 1960. Britain's own version of Vietnam, but with a very different outcome. During the 19th century, the British had absorbed the sultanates of the Malayan Peninsula into the British Empire as protectorates and had established the Crown Colony of Singapore. During the Second World War, Malaya was occupied by the Japanese. A resistance movement, the Malayan People's Anti-Japanese Army, waged a guerrilla war against the occupiers. Just as in Vietnam, these resistance fighters were supplied with arms by the Allies and actually worked with the British SOE operatives. And just in Vietnam, local communists played a key role in that resistance. In fact, the communist leader, 23-year-old Chin Peng, was rewarded by the British for his wartime service and made an officer of the British Empire, OBE. Somewhat ironic, based on the rest of this story. After the war, the communist army was reabsorbed into civilian life, but they'd hidden their arms in the jungle for another battle. For they had a bigger agenda, to kick the British out and establish a communist People's Republic on the peninsula. Meanwhile, the British tentatively inched towards some form of self-governance, but under pressure from the Malay majority, they decided not to grant citizenship to the thousands of Chinese squatters living in ramshackle settlements on the edge of the jungles. In 1948, the armed wing of the Malayan Communist Party, the Malayan National Liberation Army, went back to their jungle arms dumps and launched a rebellion, or in their words, a national liberation war, against the British. The communists found a fertile recruiting ground amongst those disenfranchised and marginalised Chinese squatter communities. Throughout the communist insurgency, the MNLA remained about 90% Chinese, in a country where they made up less than 40% of the population. And that inability to reach out beyond the Chinese community seriously weakened their effectiveness. At this stage, the communist forces under their leader, Chin Peng, numbered somewhere approaching 8,000 fighters. They were initially opposed by six Gurkha, two Malay and four British battalions. The latter included a battalion from the Royal Artillery, acting as infantry. In June 1948, three British plantation managers were murdered in Perak, in the northwest of the peninsula. Police stations were attacked, trains derailed, buses set on fire. In an effort to undermine the economy, rubber plantations and tin mines were attacked, and workers' homes burned to the ground. A campaign of intimidation of workers began, including the burning down of their houses and hacking to death by machete of local elders who opposed the communists. The British immediately declared a state of emergency in Perak, and within days it extended it to the whole of the Malayan Peninsula. Curfews were ordered, travel restrictions imposed, detention without trial introduced, and the death penalty imposed on anyone caught with a weapon. The swiftness of this British response prevented the communists rising in the urban areas, and the MNLA decided to fall back on the jungles of the interior. A stalemate now ensued. The MNLA were not strong enough to launch an offensive in the more populated and Malay-dominated areas, whilst the British, despite reinforcements, did not have the numbers to hunt them down in the jungle. Moreover, even if the British had the numbers, they lacked any intelligence about MNLA movements. The populations that the communists themselves used for information and supplies, the Chinese squatters and the indigenous Aboriginal people in the jungles, were outside of the British orbit. The squatter camps in particular were a law unto themselves. There was no civil administration or policing from the colonial authorities, and consequently, no way to tap into the very populations who could have provided information on the fighters' whereabouts. With cultural and family ties to the fighters, as well as a sense of alienation from the British, the squatters provided valuable support for the fighters, both in intelligence, recruits, and above all, food supplies. <laughs> 
1950, a veteran of the Burma campaign in World War II, Lieutenant General Sir Harold Briggs, was brought out of retirement to head up the counterinsurgency. Assuming the position of Director of Operations in Malaya, he developed a strategy to take on the Communists, the Briggs Plan. His infantry ranks had been swelled by reinforcements which had started arriving from the August of 1948. And with his growing numbers, Briggs launched a series of sweeps to drive the Communists into pre-prepared ambushes. Meanwhile, airplanes were used to target suspected bases in the jungle, which were hard to reach on foot. But his Briggs plan was not merely about trying to hunt the Communists down in the never-ending jungle. The veteran commander realised that the key to the MLLA's continuing resistance wasn't access to arms, but access to food. And that food was being provided by the Chinese squatter communities on the edge of the jungle. Briggs changed British policy to deny the Communists that vital support. By the end of 1951, over 400,000 squatters had been controversially rehoused in what were called new villages. These villages were provided with many of the essentials the Chinese squatters had not had previously, such as running water, better quality housing, schools, medical facilities. Rice, their central diet, was cooked in a central kitchen and distributed to families according to their needs. In other words, there was no spare uncooked rice for residents to pass on to the MNLA. And even if they wanted to, they couldn't, as the new villagers were surrounded by barbed wire fences with armed guards controlling access at the main gate. As you might guess, many Chinese saw themselves initially as inmates rather than as free citizens. But militarily, the strategy worked. The communist forces were deprived of crucial food supplies and also new recruits. But in October 1951, just as it looked like they were gaining the upper hand, disaster was to hit the British. Sometimes people benefit from lucky moments in history. In October 1951, that beneficiary was Chin Peng. A communist band had set up an ambush on a road ready to fire at any British vehicle passing by. It just so happened that the first car to pass them was carrying the British High Commissioner himself, Sir Henry Gurney. In the ensuing firefight, Gurney was killed. Just to compound the British problems, General Briggs had recently retired due to ill health. Suddenly, they were left without a senior man in either the civil or the military leadership. But not for long. Just two weeks after Gurney's assassination, Winston Churchill was re-elected British Prime Minister. In true Churchill fashion, he decided that decisive action was needed. And the man he chose to deliver that action was 52-year-old General Sir Gerald Templer. Templer had joined the army in 1916 and had served with the Royal Irish Fusiliers on the Western Front. Between the wars, he had seen action during the Arab Revolt in Palestine, and he had also been a reserve in the British team at the 1924 Olympic Games in Paris. Those games were made famous in the film Chariots of Fire. Anyway, back to the story. During the Second World War, he was promoted to Lieutenant General in 1942, the youngest in the British Army at the time, before commanding the 56th Division at Anzio during the Italian campaign. Wounded by a landmine in 1944, he finished the war in charge of the German Directorate of SOE. He was now pulled out of his role as Director of Military Intelligence at the War Office in London to fill the positions of both High Commissioner and Director of Military Operations in Malaya. Templer arrived in Malaya in January 1952 and despite being a military man, came up with a non-military solution to win the war. Or if we're keeping the insurance companies happy, the emergency. He outlined his strategy in the following words. The answer lies not in pouring more soldiers into the jungles, but in the hearts and minds of the Malayan people. The shooting side of this business is only 25% of the trouble, and the other 75 lies in getting the people of this country behind us. Templar is credited with the phrase hearts and minds used in counterinsurgency campaigns since then, including Vietnam. Getting the people behind him would take a variety of methods. First, he continued the Briggs plan, in particular with regards to the new villages. But he went further, stationing police in the villages to build trust with the previously alienated communities. And as part of that strategy, he insisted on recruiting officers from the Chinese population too. Next, he increased the number of both local police and the number of Malayan battalions, so that the jungle war was not seen as just being fought by white British soldiers, but as a war on behalf of all Malays. A local home guard was established to protect both the new villages, workers' houses on rubber plantations and other public facilities. Eventually, the home guard 
would number over 250,000 local Malays, and they would enable British troops to be released for more operational roles. Templar also reversed the previous policy of denying members of the Chinese community rights of citizenship. The final strand of the hearts and minds strategy was to pull the carpet from underneath the communists. The British announced that independence would be granted before the end of the decade. Any pretensions the communists had to be fighting a war of national liberation, a war that incidentally the majority of the population had not actively been supporting, were dashed. Why fight the British when they were going anyway? The non-communist nationalist leaders saw no reason to throw in their lot with the communists, especially when communist rule in China under Chairman Mao was already looking less than rosy. When Chin Peng was invited to a peace conference in 1955, it was leading nationalist Tunku Abdul Rahman and not the British that demanded that the MNLA surrender unconditionally. Peng walked out, claiming that the armed liberation would prevail. But it was Rahman who would have the last laugh, as you'll find out later. Alongside these actions to win over hearts and minds, General Templar also turned the screws on the MNLA in the Jungle War. From that initial 13 battalions in Malaya in 1948, British reinforcements had grown to 24 infantry battalions by 1954. And they weren't merely British. The Malayan emergency was a Commonwealth response to a communist insurgency. The Australian and New Zealand armies, air forces and navies joined the fight against the communists. So too did troops from the British colonies in Africa, the King's Africa Rifles from Kenya, as well as regiments from the Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasaland, modern-day Zambia, Zimbabwe, Malawi, also arrived in Malaya. 1,600 Fijian troops took part and earned a fearsome reputation in the process. Next up, a jungle warfare school was established to equip the troops with the specific skills needed to both survive, track their enemy and fight in the jungle. It's worth noting that up to half of the men in the British regiments deployed to Malaya, which included the Suffolks, the Hampshires, Scots Guards, the Devonshire Regiment, to name but a few, were made up of conscripts on national service. The expansion of the British Gurkha and Commonwealth forces was mirrored by a rapid enlargement of the Malayan Regiment. They would ultimately form about a third of the forces fighting the Communists. This numerical strength enabled Templar to conduct more thorough sweeps through the jungle areas. During the emergency, over 6,000 communist insurgents were killed by the security forces, a further 1,200 were captured, and many more simply surrendered. RAF and Commonwealth bombers targeted communist bases deep in the jungle. Controversially, they also used pesticides to destroy crops that the MNLA were trying to grow. Some argue that it was the precedent for the Americans using Agent Orange in Vietnam. Whilst the Royal Navy provided additional support near the coast, the British also put into practice their experiences from the Burma campaign in World War II, not least the Chindit operations. Aircraft and new helicopters dropped men deep in the jungle and then resupplied them without having to rely on roads. The war in the Burmese jungles gave the British army the Chindits. The war in the Malayan jungle saw the rebirth of the Special Air Service, the SAS. Originally formed during the Second World War under David Sterling, the SAS had been disbanded at the end of the conflict, only to be reformed as part of the Territorial Army. A unit was trained to go to Korea, but was diverted to Malaya, where they came under the command of former Chindit, Major Mad Mike Colvert. Colvert had already established a deep jungle penetration unit, the Malayan Scouts, in 1950. Eventually, the SAS squadrons operating in the Malayan jungles included three from Britain, one from New Zealand, and one from Rhodesia. One of the members of that last squadron, Ron Reed Daly, would go on to command the Salu Scouts in the Rhodesian Bush War in the 1970s. The war, both for the hearts and minds of the people and on the battlefield, turned decisively against the communists. In 1950, there had been over 500 terrorist incidents every month. By 1953, that had dropped to just 100 a month. The new villages had not only cut off food supplies to the MNLA, but there was a growing level of trust between the inhabitants and the security forces. The 1st Battalion, 7th Gurkha Rifles Regiment, reported that in June 1951, they'd obtained just two pieces of intelligence from the civilian population. Just over a year later, that had risen to 65 a month. By the end of 1954, when Templar left Malaya, what remained of the communist forces, probably about 1,000 at the most, 
had been pushed to the very far north, towards the Thai border. And there, deprived of food and support, it struggled to sustain itself, let alone remain a threat. The insurgency had been well and truly defeated. No wonder that with his tough military approach and his strategy to win over the civilian population, Time magazine called Templar the Smiling Tiger. True to British promises, in 1957, the Federation of Malaya gained independence. The first Prime Minister was Tonkal Abdurrahman, the man who had insisted on the MLA's unconditional surrender a few years earlier. He declared the emergency, which he referred to as the People's War, over in 1960. And in 1963, Malaya united with the former British colonies of Singapore, Sarawak and North Borneo to form Malaysia, although Singapore left a couple of years later. The British response to the Malayan emergency stands out as probably the most successful counterinsurgency operation undertaken by Western powers during the Cold War. A successful outcome to a conflict that was not simply won by force of arms, but by winning over hearts and minds as well. And to this day, it's still studied by military leaders around the world as a blueprint for how to deal with counterinsurgencies. But the success of Malaya came at a heavy price. 1,442 British servicemen lost their lives, more than any other conflict the British have fought in since the Second World War. To put that 1,442 into context, 457 British servicemen were killed in Afghanistan, 178 in Iraq, 237 in the South Atlantic Falklands conflict. Meanwhile, 1,446 Malayan troops and police also died, and within the wider Commonwealth force, 39 Australians, 25 Fijians, 15 New Zealanders and 8 Rhodesians were killed. But their sacrifices were not in vain. Malaya and then Malaysia did not go communist and were saved from some of the human misery that other countries in the region have endured. In fact, Malaysia has been a beacon of stable, democratic government and prosperity in the region for 50 years. Not a bad way to wind down your empire. Thanks for joining me today, and if you enjoy learning about British military history and the history of the British Empire, then you might enjoy my videos on the Suez Crisis of 1956 and the Asian Emergency in the 1960s. Click on the links appearing now. Thanks for all your support, especially to Michael, Ed and Dalton who've clicked on the membership button below. Keep well, and I'll see you again very soon.